All righty, let me get attendance done and then we can get started, folks. All righty, Amina, Ava, Carson, Cole, Colin, Dean, Emma, Fayang, Jessica, Josh, Katie, Maha. Marianne, Mateo, Matthew, Olivia, Rocco, Ritika. Rose, Sarah, Sophia, oh, Stanley, Sophia, Talia, no Vicky either, eh? Holy Strombolis, where is everyone today? All righty, well, we, I want to get started because I, this is a little bit, it's not longer, but I really want to make sure we leave enough time at the end of this lesson to talk about anything and everything relating to lesson four. So let's get started by taking a look at the next stages of digestion. With regards to di oops, with regards to digestion, if you recall, all the way start to finish, okay? You should know start to finish the entire journey. And really, I can't stress this enough. Uh, at the end of this lesson, once you go through it or at the end of this day, bug your parents, bug a sibling, bug a friend, call them up. I know people don't call anyone anymore, if you want to call a friend, go talk to your mom, dad, guardian, brother, sister, cousin, uncle, whatever, right? Go talk to them and tell them, hey, what's up? Okay, so when you eat food and start to finish, start to finish from the time you chew something, pick your favorite food and explain how you digest it. Start to finish after this lesson, okay? I, I promise you, if you can explain it to someone in that context, you will be in great shape with regards to your understanding for this lesson. So think of your favorite food, something you absolutely love to eat. And after this lesson, you find someone and you explain, start to finish, how you eat, digest, and get maximum nutrients from that food. Because I promise you, if you can explain it to someone like that, you're gonna be in great shape for the quiz on Friday, okay? Yeah. If you wanna explain it to me even, we'll find time over the next two days, okay? We'll find time over the next two days. I'll put you in your groups. You can explain it to each other. You can take turns explaining to each other. Tell a little show and tell about your favorite food, whatever it is. But if you can do that, I promise you, you'll get the gist of it. I'm lactose intolerant. I drank milk to feel the consequences while thinking about the lactose structure. <laughs> it was a sacrifice worth making. I salute you for your sacrifice. It was a noble sacrifice. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's get into the last bit of digestion in the small intestine. Because if you recall, the duodenum or the duodenum, whatever you prefer, yes, solution, oat milk, um, whichever one you prefer calling it, that is where the vast majority of chemical digestion happens in the body. Now that all of those nutrients have been chemically digested, it's time for absorption. And that happens in the jejunum, which is the first leg of the small intestine journey of absorption, and then the ileum. So these two places or these two structures are the location of absorption of nutrients in their simplest pieces. I read that as cat milk for a second was very... <laughs> oh, that's funny, Katie. So uh, location of absorption of nutrients. Remember, the chemical digestion between the mouth, stomach, and the duodenum has broken every, well, not every single, but almost every single piece of nutrients in that food, and it's broken it down into its simplest pieces, right? Carbohydrate in either a single or a disaccharide, mono or disaccharide. The, the fats have been broken down into lipids, right? And then proteins have been broken down into amino acids. Now it's time to get those nutrients into the body so that way it can go off to all the places it needs to go. And that happens in the jejunum and ileum. So the interior lining of the jejunum and the ileum is very interesting. We really, really, really want to try to maximize the surface area. And we do that by way of villi 
and microvilli, okay? Or villus, which is the singular of villi. These are structures that, um, that kind of look like wave patterns, as you can see here. Let me just, oop, let me just highlight this, bam, right? It's kind of like a wave pattern. And those are the villi. And then on the villi, there are microvilli. So even tinier waves of tissue that protrude out and they greatly increase the surface area of the small intestine and allow for maximum absorption. Now, uh, I'm gonna make a gross reference. If you've ever had tripe or if you've ever had um, the digestive system of cow or pig, for lack of a better word, in food, as I have, the think about what the outside ridges look like. And they are covered in tiny little ridges. And those tiny little ridges are covered even more in tiny little ridges. And it really allows for maximum absorption due to increased surface area. Because if you just had a single tube, remember, the small intestine is a diameter of two and a half centimeters approximately. If you just had that single tube, this surface area alone is not enough for digestion. So there's this tiny ridges and then tiny ridges on the tiny ridges, which improve the surface area and allow for maximum absorption. Okay, questions about villi or microvilli and how it helps improve surface area. Uh, do you mind explaining how it improves surface area again? Okay, yeah, sure. So um, when you think of the, actually, I'll, I'll, let me go back up. Ba, 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 ba. Hold on. Let me reshare my screen with you. Okay, so here we have a circle. Oh, I'll go. So here we have a circle, okay? This is one option. This is option two. Which one has a greater surface area? Option one or option two? Which one has a greater internal surface area? So I'll highlight the surface in one. Here is the um, available amount of surface for absorption, okay? It's the diameter, right? Or it's the circumference, sorry, it's the circumference. Whereas option two, all of these, beep, 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 is the available surface area for absorption within the jejunum and the ileum. And then even further, even further, each one of those spikes has tiny, tiny, tiny little microvilli on there on top of all of them. So it improves the surface area. It gives it a larger surface for absorption. Does that make a bit more sense? Okay, so the first option is like just a normal tube, whereas the second option is what the intestines look like. It's not a graph, it was just a diagram. It's just a diagram of what the inside of the intestine looks like. Yeah. All right, any other questions? So that jejunum and ileum have an increase in internal surface area because if it was just a cylinder tube, it would just be that flat surface of cells that's allowed to have that absorption. 
Whereas what happens actually is there's lots of tiny ridges and folds within your small intestine that increase surface area and allow for maximum absorption. So let's take a look at that nutrient absorption in more detail. Uh, what happens if the intestines didn't have villi? Uh, we would only really, so the, the villi and microvilli increase surface area by about 80 to 150%, depending on uh, each person's different, right? So we would get 80 to 100% less nutrients than, um, than what we would normally get as opposed to just a cylindrical plain old tube with no ridges or anything. So it improves the absorption by 80 to 150%, which is quite significant, which is why we have them. Evolution. We'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of this unit though. All right, so nutrient absorption. We know that these nutrients need to be absorbed, but now we're gonna learn a little bit about the chemical makeup of those nutrients that allow for absorption to happen. Uh, so it only improves absorption, but it doesn't protect the intestine from anything, correct. It actually uh, can cause issues because if those folds and those villi and microvilli get torn, uh, it can cause bleeding and, and issues later on. But the, the, the benefit far outweighs the, the, neg the positives outweigh the negatives, so to speak. All righty, let's take a look at nutrient absorption because we know that some of these nutrients are in their simplest forms and we know that they are able to be absorbed. But now we're going to look at the chemical properties of some of these nutrients and why it's allowed to be absorbed the way that they are. Because water soluble nutrients that can be things that can be dissolved in water are able to be absorbed into the bloodstream and they enter through veins and arteries. As we get into the circulatory system later on, I will talk more detail about veins and arteries, but these move blood. If you weren't sure about what they were, they move blood to and from different areas. So the water soluble nutrients are able to dissolve in water, which is our primary uh, or the primary ingredient, if you will, in blood. So the fact that blood is predominantly made of water allows for those water soluble nutrients to be dissolved in that blood and they can be transferred around the body by way of veins and arteries. So as I said, water is the main component of blood. And so nutrients that are water soluble can move via the capillary network in the villi. So the capillary network in the villi, if you look at the diagram above, it's a bunch of um, blood transporting tubes that kind of wrap around the inside of the villi. And it allows for nutrients that are water soluble as the villi absorbs nutrients, right? The nutrients can pass directly through the villus cells and they are able to go into the blood and then the blood can carry those nutrients like sugar all around your body. So things also like sodium, which is a micronutrient, vitamin B, sugars, and amino acids, which are the macronutrients. Those big ones that we need in order to produce energy are water soluble and they can be transported around by way of our blood. We don't go into specific details just quite yet. Later on, I'll talk about some of the mechanisms that allow for absorption and transportation. But if it's water soluble, it can move through blood. That's the big takeaway here um, with regards to that. It can be absorbed, be put into blood, and then the blood can carry it to where it needs to get. All right, any questions with regards to nutrient absorption with regards to water soluble, water soluble nutrients? Once again, thank you for those of you using the check marks. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Helps me help you. All righty. 
And so I'll talk a little bit more about fat soluble nutrients as well. And then if any questions come to mind, I can, we can talk a little bit more about those because as I alluded to with water soluble nutrients, it's great that it can be moved through the blood. That's perfect. We know the blood transports nutrients all around our body, but what happens if it's not water soluble? What happens for things like fat soluble nutrients that cannot enter the blood because they are non-polar, non-polar. For those of you, again, you can see the importance of your understanding of grade 11 chemistry. For those of you who have taken or are taking grade 11 chemistry, you understand what nonpolar is. Nonpolar means that it does not like water, for lack of a better word. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> it basically means it cannot dissolve in water, okay? Cannot dissolve in water, all right? So these fat-soluble nutrients need to enter something special inside of the body. And those are called the lacteals, the lacteal system, which is a component of the immune system. So the immune system actually helps with digestion and absorption, which is an interesting idea to consider because normally the immune system is associated with fighting off infections, fighting off viral diseases, um, and responding to all sorts of intruders from outside the body. But it is actually a crucial, important factor in digestion as well, because it needs to be processed in the immune system or that lacteal duct or the lacteal system in order to enter the bloodstream correctly. So the body turns these non-polar fat-soluble nutrients into something that can be transported by way of the bloodstream. So fats or lipids need to be packaged up before they travel through the bloodstream, okay? All right, let's take a second here. If there are questions revolving around either water-soluble or fat-soluble nutrients and how they get going, uh, we can talk about that here before we go into the movement of nutrients and absorption and look at some of the actual specifics of the cellular biology that allows for the nutrient absorption to happen. because then we get into the thickets of some cellular biology with regards to specifics of how nutrients gets absorbed into the body. All right, some questions, I think. Let's see it. Uh, wait, non-polar means there's no electrical net charge in molecules and it doesn't mix with water because water is polar, correct. So a non-polar charged particle cannot bond with a charged one. Basically, yeah, that's the chemical component aspect of it. Um, and so it can't orient itself in such a way that it dissolves in water effectively. So we call them fat soluble nutrients. What does it mean by process? What exactly happens to fat soluble nutrients so it can enter the bloodstream? Oh, Jessica, you'll find out in third year cellular biology. It's a lot. There's a lot of processes that happen. The, the cells, specifically the lacteal and immune system cells, have evolved a very complex way of turning that fat into a not only a water-soluble um, nutrient, but it also can turn it into sugars, for lack of a better word. And it is a complex process that we really don't um, get into. You'll spend about three weeks learning about it in, in second and third year cellular biology and anatomy and physiology. So. Um, that can be a, 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 can allude to the complexity of the, the human body as it processes these nutrients because it is a, it's a quite a, a complex process. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, it has to go through three different systems, um, and each system has about six or seven different cells that are responsible for going through any number of, of chemical reactions that process it. And I, off the top of my head, there's probably about 50 or so steps and chemical reactions to take it from a fat to a, um, a processed water soluble nutrient. So it's complex for lack of a better word, which we don't really have the, I'm trying to think of a better way to describe it in a simpler term as I filibuster a little. The best way to describe it is that the, the chemical components of the fat get separated by a couple of chemical reactions and then they get rebuilt with some things attached to it that allow for it to move through um, the body. Uh, the best way to describe it is um, imagine you're playing with Lego 
and you are trying to move a very delicate Lego structure that you have built. Um, but in order to move it, you can't touch it. You can't pick it up unless you take it apart first and turn it into a very sturdy, a very sturdy object. Then you can pick it up, move it. And then when you get it to that place, you take it apart and put it back together in, a de in that delicate fashion. The fat soluble nutrients turns into a water soluble nutrient. Correct. For lack of a better word, yes. But it's, uh, it's quite complex. Hopefully that satisfies. You, are, you can look it up. Um, maybe I'll link it for those of you as like an extension who are quite curious. You can look at all the different steps, uh, depending on how your, your cellular or your biochemistry is from grade 11. Uh, and if you've taken or are taking grade 12 chemistry or will take it, you might understand some of the chemical processes, but yeah, it's complex. All right, let's take a look at the movement of nutrients by absorption, because I've alluded to this idea here that nutrients have to go from the small intestine into the body. And we're going to look at some of the, the, the basic chemical processes that allow for movement from the small intestine. This is the small intestine, small intestine into the blood slash lacteal ducts. I took AP, but I'm lost whenever you make a chemistry. <laughs> Matthew, geez Louise, review your chemistry for next year. Okay. So there's a couple of ways with which the, um, oops, yeah, that's small intestine. A couple of ways with which we need to understand how nutrients move from the small intestine into the cells. There's passive transport, which is, as the name suggests, passive. It allows for nutrients to kind of move freely. Uh, some help is allowed or given, but ultimately it's pretty passive. And then there's active transport, okay? Now, here's where we start to connect some of the ideas from previous lessons to this idea. Because if you recall, I talked about how important it is for proteins and amino acids in cellular structures. We are now going to look at a non-enzyme protein that helps with cellular function. And these proteins are called transport proteins. So I'll get into more of those in just a second. So the active transport uses what's called a transport protein and energy in the form of ATP, which is cellular energy. Uh, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. You don't have to know that so uh, until next year, so don't worry too much about that. But it's going to help move that nutrients from the small intestine into the cells of the, um, the villi and villus, and then eventually into the bloodstream and the lacteal ducts. So movement, I say movement is selective here. This is a crucial component because it doesn't just let anything in, okay? There are specifics that it, it is looking for. And the specifics are all of those macronutrients, all of those vitamins that we've talked about earlier. There are some things in our food that are not actually broken down and digested. Spoiler alert, it turns into waste later on that we do not want to absorb. So it doesn't just let in everything. These transport proteins are very, very, very selective with what they let in. Okay, so we're going to look at passive transport first, passive transport first, and passive transport molecules are going to move through uh, the cellular membrane of the villi or villus, and they're going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration across that membrane. If you recall from your grade nine and grade 10 chemistry and uh, biology, we are talking about diffusion among other things, okay? Uh, Wi-Fi connection is having issues. Okay. Yeah. No worries. So moving from high to low concentration. Uh, from high to low concentration. Uh, so passive transport does not need energy. And this is pretty great because as we move through some of these processes, you'll realize how energy um, dependent they are. And it actually takes a, quite a bit of energy in order to take nutrients in, but passive transport does not really require any energy. So that is a good thing because then all of those nutrients that are able to passively transport in 
can be utilized to make more energy for other things. So the first one we'll look at is diffusion. My hope is that diffusion is an easy peasy lemon squeezy one for you because you've probably been learning about diffusion for most of your science careers in grade seven, grade eight, grade nine, and grade 10. This is where particles pass directly through a membrane and it's going to pass through based on the overall structure. So some minerals can pass through, uh, some types of sugars can pass through, and it's pretty straightforward with regards to um, you know, the use. You all probably did a lab when you were younger where you had two beakers, they were connected by a tube, and then there was a, uh, a permeable membrane in there, and it allowed for diffusion of particles and passing right through this membrane that showed that you know, diffusion can happen from high to low concentration gradients. So diffusion is the first one. I'm hopeful that you all remember what that is. Beep. So there's diffusion, and then there's also facilitated diffusion. As I alluded to, and as I pointed out earlier, it's going to use specific types of transport proteins that help move things, move things through. So with regards to it, it's still moving from high to low concentration, but some of the bigger particles, some of the bigger particles, uh, some like disaccharides and uh, some proteins, specifically some amino acids, they can't quite move through that permeable membrane that is the cell membrane, but, but they can be moved through these transport proteins. So these transport proteins help facilitate diffusion and movement from high to low concentration. These transport proteins do not require any energy, so that still allows for a saving of energy for, as we look at it next, active transport. Okay, any questions on passive transport before I move on to, uh, to active transport? What is the point of moving from high to low concentration? Okay, so, Mateo, what's your favorite food? What's your favorite food? Tell me right now, on the spot. One food that you could eat right now or could eat forever, what's that? Pasta. Okay, so, pasta. You eat this pasta. It's predominantly fat and carbohydrates, right? There's a bit of protein in there as well, depending on the flour that's used to make the pasta, but... It's predominantly carbohydrates, okay? And sauce, yeah, well, but we're just focusing on pasta. We'll assume Mateo just likes plain pasta, just, just cooked plain pasta, no, no extra stuff. You eat the pasta, it goes through all those digestive processes that we talked about from mouth, stomach, small intestine, and now it's being absorbed. The cells in your small intestine that make up the villus, make up the villi, make up the blood vessels that are, around, that are surrounding the, um, the small intestine, they don't really have that much nutrients in there, right? Whereas the now fully digested chyme, as it moves through your small intestine, there are tons of nutrients in there. Carbohydrates, protein, lipids, micronutrients, macronutrients, the whole nine yards, right? Tons of it in there. If we didn't have movement from high to low concentration, then none of that would be absorbed passively. Correct, Sarah, yeah. So Sarah asks, uh, facilitated diffusion still moves things from through the membrane. It just uses transport proteins to actively or to, to passively direct um, the uh, nutrients through. Correct. So Mateo, does that work? Does that make sense as to why we move it from or why it's important to consider movement from high to low concentration? Because we want those nutrients that are highly concentrated as a result of being digested that's inside the small intestine. We want those nutrients to move from the small intestine into the cells and then into the bloodstream. Cool? Yes, exactly. So then they can be used. 
That's the whole point of digestion at the end of the day, right? To get those nutrients we consumed into our blood and into the cells of our body that need them. Do you remember repeating what Sarah said about? Yeah. So Sarah said, she's saying, so facilitated diffusion still moves things through the membrane, through, still moves things through the cellular membrane of the small intestine. It just uses transport proteins instead of directly passing through. So those transport proteins and facilitated diffusion are really just allowing certain things to move from the small intestine into the cells of the small intestine um, and then into the blood or into the lacteal ducts. Alrighty. So that is passive. Oop. No worries. That is passive transport. Let's look at active transport now. As I alluded to earlier, active transport is going to use energy, but there's a caveat here. Active transport is actually going to move things from low concentration to high concentration. So just as we established in passive transport, things want to passively move through membranes from high to low, from high to low concentration. Uh, so facility is just a method of getting through the skin that is not selective. Correct. Oh, no, it's still selective, Matthew. It's still selective. Um, facilitated diffusion is still selective. All of the transport processes are selective, meaning they're looking for specific things. There are actually different transport proteins for different types of nutrients and different types of, uh, of vitamins and minerals, et cetera. And I'm going to talk about that now in active transport. Because there are some high concentrations of molecules inside the small intestine cells or inside the, the tissue surrounding the small intestine. But that doesn't mean we don't want to bring in more of those things. Um, I'll go into some examples later on, like with regards to salts, with regards to minerals. There are a lot of those in the cell and the tissues surrounding the small intestine. So even though the concentration of those things are higher in the tissue, we still want to bring those minerals from the small intestine tube into the tissue surrounding. And that's where active transport comes in. So the only difference between passive transport and active transport is high to low for passive and then low to high for active, meaning things are brought in. Correct. So active transport will always require energy to go against that gradient, right? It will always require energy to go against that chemical gradient because normally things just want to move from high to low concentration. The cell has to act or the body has to actively spend energy in order to bring things from low concentration to a high concentration. And that energy is in the form of ATP. Uh, yeah, so what are some examples of things brought in? Good question. Let me type it out for you. So some examples, sodia, oh, uh, Na, uh, chlorine, um, some protein, or sorry, some amino acids. And I want to say there's one more, magne no, 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 uh, calcium, calcium. All of those are, are macro and micronutrients, which in some cells around the small intestine and, and the actual villus and microvillus cells, they're actually quite highly concentrated, especially as they bring in more, right? Especially as they bring in more due to, due to digestion. But because it wants to get every last little bit of nutrients that it can from that digested food, we use active transport to bring in the things that are already in high concentration in the tissue surrounding. To, to really get every last little drop. Yeah, so sodium, oh, sorry, I didn't unshare my screen. Sodium, chlorine, some amino acids, and calcium are really good examples. Um, protein will always be uh, go through facilitated diffusion, and most vitamins will also go through facilitated diffusion. But amino acids specifically that, uh, again, I won't go into the different, but there are some amino acids that are highly concentrated and uh, in, the, in the tissues around the small intestine, and they still want to bring those amino acids in there. 
So hopefully that answers some of your questions. Any other questions? Because folks, we're almost there. We're almost there. That does it for the small intestine. That does it for the small intestine. Those examples are for facilitated diffusion. Correct. Correct the mundo. Those are, oh yeah, sorry, yes. Those are examples of facilitated diffusion. Okay, any other questions about diffusion in any way, shape, or form, or transport of any way, shape, or form? Uh, sorry, Jessica, those ones are examples of, um, of active transport, not facilitated diffusion. The calcium, the amino acids, the chlorine, and the sodium, those are examples of the of facilitated diffusion where energy needs to be used. Or sorry, um, active transport, not facilitated diffusion, active transport. Do molecules accumulate before moving? Kind of, kind of, Colin, kind of. They try really hard to get it from the, the small intestine cells into the bloodstream as quickly as possible. Uh, are you able to provide particles or nutrients that use facilitated diffusion? Facilitated diffusion is everything. Um, it's, it's, it's lipids, it's proteins, and it's carbohydrates. It's really, because uh, there's like, in just the small intestine alone, there's like six different um, active and passive transport proteins, and they all are responsible for different types of saccharides, monosaccharides, disaccharides, different types of lipids, different types of amino acids. So like we'd be here all day looking at the different proteins responsible for which amino acid here and there. Some proteins are responsible for four amino acids. Some proteins are responsible for two amino acids. So it's like kind of, uh, it's kind of messy. It's kind of messy. It's complex. As you see, as we get further down this rabbit hole, things get more and more complex. And uh, even in grade 12 biology, when we, like, when we do anatomy and physiology of this stuff again, we still don't go into the type of detail that it, uh, that it lends. Like I said, uh, in first year biology, uh, just intro bio, in second year microbiology and um, biochemistry, and then in third year cell bio, like three, three full years of classes and it, it just kept getting more complex. So we're really just the tip of the iceberg for what we talk about in this class. So you'll have to be patient. You'll have to study biology throughout your post-secondary uh, career to, to learn even more detail about all those things. Because like I said, it's, it's quite complex. All right, let's take a look at the last two pieces of the puzzle of digestion with the large intestine and then eventually the rectum slash anus. All right, so large intestine. Well, it's, as the name implies, large. It's much wider in terms of diameter, about seven and a half centimeters. That's probably too big, but about seven and a half centimeters. Its length is smaller, right? Its length is smaller, but when we talk about 
small versus large intestine, we're talking about the size, small intestine, large intestine. Now I'm exaggerating, it's more like this. Large intestine, small intestine. We're talking about the diameter, not the length, right? Because the small intestine is longer and the large intestine is smaller. But it is a short, wide organ and it has three main functions. Absorption, absorption, absorption. But in this case, in this case, it's going to do the predominant vast majority of absorption of vitamins, minerals, and water. So the small intestine does absorb some vitamins and some minerals, all right? Not, but not as large amount of absorption as the large intestine. So the large intestine is still absorbing things. Vitamins, minerals, and water are the three big ones. Oh, 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 not there yet. All right, so to further our understanding, this, I've alluded to it several times before in previous units as well as this unit, but the large intestine is where the beauty of our microbiological flora take place. There are approximately 500 different bacterial species that live inside of our large intestine and they help to provide us with nutrients. They are responsible for not only um, producing some vitamins, but they're also responsible for helping to break down fiber, and then they use those sugars to, to produce really good things for our body. They're also responsible for so, like so many other things. Um, I read a study recently, a couple of years ago, that talked about how healthy your gut flora is, is actually strongly indicative of mental health. So there's so many different factors that contribute to a healthy gut flora. It's usually a high fiber, high vegetable diet. Um, it's usually less meat. It's usually lots of water. It's usually exercise. It's usually exposing yourself to as many different bacterial cultures as possible. Um, and it has, we're just, just, just starting to learn how important our bacterial cultures in our large intestine are. And as we move through it, we're really gonna, um, or as we learn more over the, you know, the next decade or two, we're really gonna, I think, start to appreciate uh, our large intestines and how we should be kinder to our digestive system uh, to really help with our own health. It's, uh, it's not N500, it's approximately. That's the approximate symbol. This is the approximate symbol. Beep, approximately. Yep. Uh, so for those of you who are lactose intolerant, lactose intolerant, you have probably experienced this. And then I, a couple of people were talking to me about it earlier. For those of us that are lactose intolerant, um, the colon is, uh, is your main enemy, if you will, okay? Uh, this is the, the colon tube of the large intestine, and it is, oops, and it is responsible for, um, for lack of a better word, for breaking down, there are bacteria that break down, you know, certain things, and lactose is one of those things. So, if your body has not broken down the lactose, if your body has not broken down the lactose at different points of the small intestine and um, in the duodenum specifically, as a result of not having an enzyme that breaks down lactose, then that lactose gets consumed by the bacteria that live in your large intestine. And then as a result of them breaking down that lactose, it produces the gas that are, is normally associated with lactose intolerance. So a little full circle, so to speak, there from our, our conversations on lactose and uh, lactose intolerance. Uh, so the colon contains uh, four sections. These are the tubes of the large intestine, for lack of a better word. I have special gas ability. Yes, technically. <laughs> uh, and colon cancer usually happens in the lower parts of the uh, large intestine where polyps can become tumorous or cancerous. And that's where colonoscopies are, uh, are gonna be your friend as you age uh, because it's a diagnostic test that allows for, for medical trained professionals to look at the parts of your large intestine 
and uh, determine if it's healthy or not. Uh, healthy, active lifestyle, a balanced diet that contains lots of vegetables and fruit, and uh, good genes, which you cannot control, but you can control the first couple of those. So specifically with regards to digestive and colon cancer, it's predominantly uh, diet-based, right? Uh, people who consume more vegetables and fruits as their predominant source of nutrients in their diet, uh, they tend to get less colon cancer than people who do not. All right, folks, we're almost there. The last, uh oh, that's not what I wanted to do. The last pieces of the puzzle. Now that we have, oh dear. The last pieces of the puzzle is egestion or through the rectum and the anus. So we have digested all of our nutrients in the mouth, stomach, duodenum. We have absorbed all those nutrients in the small intestine and the large intestine. Everything is gone that we need. What's left is the waste product, the things that we cannot make use of. And so once the, um, you know, once that waste is, is it's stored in the, in the rectum, once it's ready to leave, it goes through the process of egestion. So ingestion, food in, egestion, waste out. The anus induced, uh, includes two anal sphincters, again, opening and closing, right? They control the movement of waste of the body. So there's an internal sphincter, which is controlled by involuntary contractions of the muscles inside of your body. And then there's external sphincters, which are thankfully voluntarily controlled uh, by the part of our brain responsible for contracting muscles. Uh, so usually the internal muscles or the involuntary muscles are the ones responsible for saying, uh, yeah, it's definitely time to go to the washroom. And then the external sphincters are the ones that control and be like, well, I'm on the bus right now. I'm home in 15 minutes. So fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, and so that's the full journey of digestion, folks. That's the full journey of digestion. Uh, are there any questions about the large intestine before I move on to the, the culminating review of all the things that we've talked about? I'm sure you'll have questions. I'm sure it'll come up. I'm sure you'll think of stuff. We have two full days to discuss it all. You're gonna review all of lesson four, hopefully today. And uh, even if you don't have a question immediately afterwards, as you review over the next few days, my hope is that those questions will, uh, will come up and you'll talk about them. And you'll ask questions and we'll, we'll get into groups and hopefully we can talk a little bit more about it. Alrighty. Is everyone done writing this down? If you are done, can I get a check mark just so I can go on to the last little review part? Um, and then, and if you're not writing it down, you're more than welcome to put a little X there to be like, no, I need like two more minutes, Mr. Q. So far I have more check marks and no, no check marks. All righty, let's take a look at the last section of this lesson. This is the different stages of digestion. Start to finish, overall stages. Ingestion, food enters through the mouth. Digestion, chemical use of digestion is enzymes to break chemical bonds down. Mechanical is the force in our jaw, in our stomach that churn and break down and chew food to turn it into smaller pieces. Absorption. In the small intestine, we're looking at carbs, amino acids, uh, and fats as the big ones that are absorbed in the small intestine. And in the large intestine, it's vitamins, minerals, and water are the big ones for the most part. And then egestion, it's the alphetazine. See you later. Thank you for, uh, for all the nutrients, but this is all waste. We don't need you anymore. The removal of waste, all of the useful nutrients have been absorbed by all the different parts of our intestine. And all that's left is the waste product to be removed. So 
You have your work cut out for you over the next couple of days. Homework section 9.6, page, page 421 and 423. Some questions. You have your review that I gave you with regards to the quiz. And um, yeah, my hope is that you can get through it all in the next couple of days. My hope is that questions come up. My hope is that you ask me to take up one or two questions with you. That way I can talk about some of the general ideas in a bit more um, uh, you know, specific to what you feel like you need context. And um, yeah, it's kind of in your hands now. Uh, what's the muscle movement that moves the bolus down? Oh, what's the muscle movement that moves the bolus down the esophagus? Does anyone remember what it's called? No, it's the, the muscle contractions that look like waves. Fun fact, it's actually what moves your things through the small intestine as well. Starts with a P. Anybody? Anybody? It's peristalsis. That's okay. Yeah, good job, Sarah. Close, Colin. Peristalsis, right? It's the movement of muscles to contract, to move that bolus down from the throat into the stomach. Yeah, peristalsis. Does it happen in the large intestine too? Yeah, that's actually the, um, the urge or the feeling to go to the washroom to, to defecate is actually caused by peristalsis in the rectum. And it basically does this and it says, hey, it's, it's time to go to the washroom. And it moves that waste down into the lower part of the rectum uh, for egestion. It happens literally in every single tube in the body. If things gotta move, then it happens, uh, peristalsis is the thing that moves it. So peristalsis is just the muscles to move the bolus and stuff. Correct. Correct. Technically in the stomach, the muscle contractions and churning that help with um, digestion, mechanical digestion in the stomach, that's technically also peristalsis because it happens in a wave usually. Yeah, no worries. Which parts do you, mean to, do you mean to scroll up to something? Or just questions? Uh, the handout is different from what you have. Do you mind going over it and fill in the, over the blanks? I'm not sure. Oh, did I give you the wrong one? What's different? That's the same. Oh, I say a lot of that stuff. Which part do you need? I think I just gave you more. The first part of the rectum sentence. Components of our food that are indigestible. Uh, oh. Food, mouth, bolus, digestive, absorption, egestion. Yeah, I'll upload the unit for a recording. The first part of the rectum sentence. The components of our food that are indigestible. What did I say there? Maybe I didn't say anything. Uh, water stored. Yeah, uh, don't worry about that. I didn't really, I don't want to go into too much detail about that, about what's not. It's mainly just, it's just like waste product is the best way to describe that. But you don't have to fill that in. That's my bad. You can get rid of this. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, you can get rid of that. Because I kind of talked about it earlier, so you don't really have to worry about that. Last sentence before stages of digestion process. When both the sphincters relax, the final waste or feces 
is released from the body. Yeah, if you wrote poo, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, food, mouth, bolus, digesting, absorption. There's no blank there, Matthew. It's digestion, absorption, no blank there, then egestion. Yeah, for your question. There's no blanks. You don't have to add any blanks there. You should have, um, yeah, there's no need to have blanks there. Bolus is the food that will become, yes, is the macro and micronutrients, or it contains macro and micronutrients. All right, any other questions? Happy to answer any and all. If you would like to get studying and get practicing, um, more than welcome to. Oh, can you explain the high to low concentration again? Yeah, sure. What specifically? Things move, well, things will move, diffuse naturally from high to low concentration in a system. And so inside the, Oh, you don't know why from high to low? Um, that's like grade nine, grade 10 chemistry and biology. It basically, a cellular membrane wants to balance out the, um, the dissolved things inside of the fluids. So inside the small intestine has a high concentration of nutrients. And uh, so like the tube has a high concentration. So I'll draw a diagram here, hold on. So, this is the, yeah, beauty. Hold on, let me just. So if this is the small intestine, right? This is your small intestine. Hold on, let me get. So this is your small intestine. Okay, this is inside the small intestine. Oh, shoot, that's okay. This is inside, and then this is the tissue around the small intestine. Beep, beep, beep. So the tissue around the small intestine, that's the small intestine. The concentration here is high. It's a high concentration in that tube of the small intestine, right? That's where all the nutrients are. It wants to take the nutrients from the inside of the small intestine and put it into the surrounding tissue. So because it's a high concentration there and low concentration outside, then the nutrients will naturally diffuse from the inside tube of the small intestine into the tissue surrounding the small intestine. Yes, to make it balanced, exactly. <clears throat> yes, if you are heading out folks, I will see you tomorrow for a nice study day. I'll have some fun activities to quiz you a little bit as well. And we'll see you all tomorrow. For active transport, why is it to low to high again? Because once the transportation happens and it balances out, it wants to get even more nutrients. It's greedy. It wants to maximize the nutrient absorption. And once it balances out and reaches equilibrium, uh, it, there's still more nutrients inside the small intestine. It wants to get every last little bit out. And bye, bye folks, for those of you who are heading out. Have a great day. You too, Matthew. Bye, folks. Um, so Jessica, the best analogy is, um, when you, if you've ever cut a lemon in half and squeezed a lemon, right, you get, you get most of the juice out, but if you really get into it, you can get every last drop out. And that's what, um, active transport is, is getting every last little bit of drop of nutrients. Is the tissues wanting more? Yes, exactly.
Yeah, it wants to get every last little bit of nutrients out. All right, so hopefully that answers some of your questions. If you got more questions, I'm happy to answer more. Think about it. We still got about 10 minutes left of class. Happy to answer any and all questions. Oh yeah, that's right. Let me open up a breakout room. And then I'll, I'll be back in like two seconds to, to answer any and all questions that people might have. I'll be back in a second, folks.